Podcast. You're listening to 12:32, an audio epic produced by Rumble Stump Entertainment. Chapter 29. Dashing wildly through the night, leaping over rocks and puddles, scrambling across the river, Vera at last arrived at the fortress. All the gates were shut, and the watchmen thought nothing of movement outside the walls. There were always stray dogs sniffing around, but if the men had been paying attention, they'd have seen a figure slip inside the walls through a narrow gap between the logs. She hid, trembling, in the hay at the stable until almost sunrise. Rhaegar came out of the hall first, walking toward the stable and strapping on his sword belt over his tunic. Vera met him in his horse's stall as herself. Vera was once a chieftain's daughter, tall and willowy, with long blonde hair sweeping down around her shoulders. Now, she was a pitiful creature. Her clothing was tattered and full of holes, her expression tortured, her speech distorted. She had scars all over her face from being whipped repeatedly with Zoriel's riding crop. Her gray eyes shifted nervously from side to side, and her bony hands never stopped fidgeting with her skirt. Rhaegar took no notice of her agitation. Well, I might draw you a bone if the news is good, he said while looking his horse over. What did you find? Vera's voice cracked as she tried to get the words out. They are still alive, my liege. The priest and the prince. She paused to wipe her mouth. Thatcher's children are are as well, but only a few You remain with them. There is a a cave, my lord. That is how they all survived the terrible fire. The prince? What prince? Rhaegar straightened, deep lines appearing on his forehead. Cardigan, my liege. He is a prince. He is of royal blood. My liege, you must haste to kill him or... Or what, you scabby wench? Rhaegar raised his hand to slap her, but she cowered at his feet. You think he will try to take the land back? Ah, you think Zoriel will kill me? She only whimpered in response. (laughs) Where is this cave? She handed him a scrap of parchment with a map scribbled on it. The cave is difficult to find, my lord. I suppose you wish for me to set you free. But you know too much. He grabbed her by the hair. Amid quiet pleas for mercy, he dragged her to the tower and chained her by the neck to the wall. Stay. (laughs) He said, laughing as he descended the stairs. Rhaegar rode out the gate before dawn alone. To bring men would make Zoriel suspicious. After all, she thought the war was over, and Rhaegar now knew that as long as Cardigan lived, it would never be over. His horse, hot-blooded and fast, took to the road like in a race. Rhaegar didn't pull him up until he was back on the ridge where he had watched the forest burn. He studied Vera's map by the early dawn light and scanned the hills until he found the cave. Slowly, he rode nearer, attempting to stay concealed among the blackened tree trunks. He circled the cave entrance just to be thorough. The sun was up as he dismounted, sword drawn. Stealthily, he climbed to the cave's mouth. No sound save for a lone circling hawk. He crept up the path to the cave, which had seen a fair amount of recent traffic. Trees had fallen across the way, and blackened twigs snapped loudly under his feet. He stopped and waited, listening. Nothing but perfect stillness. Taking a deep breath, he stepped inside the cave, ready for anything. It was empty. Nothing and nobody was there. As his eyes adjusted to the dim light inside, he could see the full extent of the cavern. When he was at last certain there was no one, he sheathed his sword. He stormed out, standing with fists clenched, kicking the ashes. He let out a long, agitated sigh. Now Cardigan and the priest were out of reach, and he couldn't keep that a secret from Zoriel for much longer. He knew she had planned to ride out today and see the burn-scarred rebel camp, and there wasn't so much as a charred skeleton to show. 
not to mention the secret cave. Why hadn't Vera told them about the cave before the fire? At this thought, his anger raged against the miserable woman who had left that detail out. What else was she not telling? It was no wonder Zoriel had beaten her so much. Rhaegar fumed as he got back on his horse and spurred it toward Brecken. There was nothing on his mind except extracting the whole truth from the twisted lips of the worthless spy. As Rhaegar rode through the gate, Zoriel met him in the courtyard. Secrets, my good Capitan, are only worth keeping if you are a good liar. Tell me, why is your stallion dripping sweat and weary from running? She held her riding crop in one hand and stroked the fur collar of her cloak with the other. Rhaegar dismounted and handed the horse to his squire. His men quietly gathered around. These two always put on a show. The soldiers were more loyal to Rhaegar than to her, or so he thought. Zoyal raised her fist in the air, and Rhaegar's three best men stepped up and took his arms, one of them taking his sword. Rhaegar realized how wrong he was. He fought for only a second, suddenly feeling subdued in spirit. My lady, what is this? Have you no faith in me? I have sworn an oath to you, and this is how you treat me, turning my men against me, treating me like a traitor. Rhaegar, you forget yourself. I am the Black Sorceress, and you are merely a soldier. Killed your lord before you came here, and how could you have done that but by turning his men against him? I am doing what you deem to have no objection to doing yourself. Surely you do not judge me to be unfair. She looked at the men holding Rhaegar. Release him, she said. And taking his sword belt from the man holding it, she stepped close to Rhaegar, reached around behind him, and buckled it back on, her gaze transfixed on his gray eyes. Remember, the hand that feeds you can also strike you. Rhaegar reverently lowered his head. My apologies, my lady, he said, his voice taut with anger, his muscles tense. Now, I want to know what you have been doing this morning. A strange sort of trance came over Rhaegar. His thoughts blurred, and he heard himself speaking, but he couldn't believe he was telling her the whole truth this time. He surprised himself even more when after telling her what he'd been doing that morning, he took her to the tower and revealed Vera. At last, he realized she was using magic on him. To his amazement and disbelief, she did nothing to him, even when he told her the priest was still alive. It was mid-morning by now, and Vera was in the form of a dog, still chained to the wall. Rhaegar opened the door and grabbed the chain, leading the hound down to the hall. When they reached the bottom and stepped into the great hall, Zoriel went to the corner of the room where she kept an assortment of powders and poisons, enhancements to her power. Hold her fast, Rhaegar. The hound saw Zoriel stalking towards her and whined, twisting at the end of the chain. Vera could change her form at will, but if another person were to change her, they needed the name of her demon. Zoriel knew this name. She smiled pleasantly, spoke in a whisper, and blew a blue powder on the dog. Vera's hound body painfully morphed into the dirty woman. Rhaegar watched in disgust. Wretch, tell us everything. Conceal nothing you know, or I will end you. Zoriel commanded. Trembling and drooling, the poor woman spoke. Vera told them of the rebel movements, their sparse numbers, their plans to continue resisting. She knew only that they were leaving Brecknockshire and the Thatcher twins had become close to the prince and the priest. Zoriel came unglued. Prince? <laughs> Cardigan is claiming to be a prince? Oh. Her rage sent her on a wild tirade, screaming at Rhaegar and blaming him directly for this additional problem. Rhaegar took her chiding but this did not sit well with her. She took a deep breath, and at the snap of her fingers, Rhaegar convulsed. His hands were over his heart, his body writhing on the floor. Vera retreated to a corner, weeping and hiding her eyes. Zoyal stood over Rhaegar, waiting. He tried to speak, and the enchantress leaned down. What was that, my Capitan? You wish for mercy, 
Now why would I show mercy to either of you? You have failed me! Her hand went to her dagger as she knelt beside Rhaegar, who was no longer convulsing, but gasping for breath. Tell me why I should let you live. His voice was barely audible. Zoryal put her ear next to his lips. What? Another prisoner? She said, raising up. To the tower! She barked at the guards. She stood and snapped her fingers again, <laughs> allowing Rhaegar to recover his breath. Zoryal paced while Vera stayed out of sight, and Rhaegar made to stand. With one look from the Enchantress, he stayed seated on the floor. Vera crawled for the door. Sneaking away, are we? Vera whimpered. <laughs> Go. Get out. Do not leave the rebels again till you have learned of their plans. Vera made a jump for the door but fell back. Zoriel had stepped on the poor girl's rags. Leave nothing out. Keep your mind sharp. No mistakes. Vera nodded and fled out the door. <laughs> Zoriel laughed at the nervous woman. Vera had once been a rival of hers, too. A young apprentice turned sorceress who served Zoriel for a time before challenging her. Vera had lost and became Zoriel's slave, much like Rhaegar saw himself becoming moment by moment. But now, both her rivals trembled in her presence. Hello, 1232 listeners. This is Callie Sue, and I'm excited to tell you about Dramafy, the ultimate platform for creators and fans of audio dramas. With oodles of genres, hundreds of shows, and thousands of episodes, Dramafy is your go-to streaming service exclusively for family-friendly audio dramas. Whether you're a devoted listener or a creator of a family-friendly masterpiece, Dramafy has something for you. And guess what, 1232 listeners? You can now enjoy 1232 on Dramafy. Just go to dramafy.com forward slash 1232. That's D-R-A-M-A-F-Y dot slash 1232 and get started for free. Happy listening. This episode of 1232 is sponsored in part by Oasis Family Media and its family of companies including Oasis Audio, Enclave Publishing, and Sky Turtle Press. Publishers of the forthcoming epic Edmund Spencer's the Fairy Queen, rendered in modern prose by Rebecca K. Reynolds and illustrated by Justin Girard. For more information, visit fairyqueen.com. That's fairyqueen.com. Or find the link in the description below. Rhaegar watched the candle burn on the table. The wax and sputtered. And now, back to the show. And the flame flickered. He reprimanded himself for getting complacent. Zoriel would discover all. He believed he had the upper hand for just a moment. He turned to look as they brought in a tall man in a t-shirt and camo fatigues, shackled to a wooden yoke. Pallid and weak, the prisoner stood, straining to hold his head high and stared at both of them defiantly. The man's strength was obviously not physical, by the state of his body, it was his spirit that defied the very air in the room. And who might you be? Zoriel asked, crossing the room to circle him. Rhaegar, who is this? And why is his presence the reason I should let you live? Taff eyed Zoriel up and down. So the rumors are true. You did come back to take Brecken. Zoriel looked at him sideways. Rhaegar tried to speak, but she held up a hand motioning for him to be silent. She looked long at Taff. You are from the future? In many ways. Taff eyed her as suspiciously as she eyed him. Take off the yoke. The soldiers obeyed. Now I can see you better, Guapissimo. Easier on the eyes than my Capitan. Rhaegar shifted on the ground, trying to get up. Zoriel didn't look at him but made another motion, like asking a dog to sit, and Rhaegar involuntarily kept sitting. His cut hand from Zoriel's knife ached, sending a dull pain all the way to his heart. Zoriel circled Taff. 
He watched her warily as they exchanged glances. Their tense body language caught Rhaegar's sharp gaze, and he watched with revived interest, both weighing the other. Taff began putting the pieces together. From the looks of it, Rhaegar had made several mistakes, and those who were fighting the Enchantress were winning to some degree. He risked speaking, hoping to keep his true identity from her a little longer. His time with Black Dagger had taught him the value of playing cards close to the chest. Where are the other two I came with? What have you done with them? He knew she would lie. Zoriel acts shocked. Why would you care? From my experience, your kind desert each other very quickly for the right price. You have a choice before you. Serve me. I will take much better care of you than my capitan. Give you rest, food, warmth. She said, lightly touching his shoulder. Taff nonchalantly shifted his shoulder away from her hand. They betrayed you. They have left you for dead. Alive or maybe somehow returned. Taff translated. I will not be making any alliances with you, sorceress. I will, however, fight your champion for my freedom. Zoriel laughed. <laughs> it was deep and cold, but delight lingered on the ringing notes. Rhaegar couldn't take it anymore. How was this man swaying her so? He risked her wrath and spoke. <coughs> Milady, let me fight in your name. Rhaegar defended weakly, his voice choked by her spell. Zoriel laughed playfully. She grabbed Taff's chin. No gray whiskers like my old watchdog over there. Hmm. Perhaps I'm in need of a new champion. Rhaegar sat speechless. He knew this game, but for her to turn on him like the weather, like a woman. But this is how it was done. And if this man will go that length for his freedom, it could be trouble for them all. Though their fortress was strong and Zoriel's magical abilities were beyond question, much of their takeover was still precarious. The people, though subdued, were not beaten. The rebels were a sign of this. And if Cardigan claimed his title and sought the other clans for help, Zoriel and Rhaegar didn't have the proper manpower to fend off a well-trained army. Rhaegar knew Zoriel sought the secrets of the strange stone in the other tower. But all he knew was that the men that came through were a genuine threat to their survival. If they had not persuaded Hoffman to betray his friend, the scribe and preacher that led to Cardigan's capture, they would have lost the castle keep long ago. Rhaegar had recognized Taff the moment he fought him in the Carol Stone Tower, planning on using him for leverage, when the time came. But if Taff killed him... You misunderstand, lady. I mean to kill your champion, and then I will challenge you. Taff jerked his head from her grasp. If I save every bit of rabble that comes through that stone, I might have my own army. Sadly, my dear man, I do not need a new champion, nor would I take such a risk with your kind. Rhaegar breathed a sigh of relief. Enough of these games. Who are you? You speak the native tongue. Zoriel asked as she sat on her throne. I might plead the same with you, lady. Who are you? You do not speak the native tongue. Never you mind. I think you are smart enough to know that I am from the East, a country of prophets, poets, learned men and women who care not for this backward country. Rhaegar was getting restless. Zoriel sensed his uneasiness and rose from her seat. She went over to her captain, who was still magically tethered to the floor. What is it, dear Capitan? What are you not telling me? She grabbed his cut hand, ripped the bandages, and pressed her thumb into the cut. <laughs> Rhaegar's eyes glazed over, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> now tell me the truth. She whispered and released his hand. Rhaegar came to with fits of coughing. Uh, Milady, he's Lachlan, Cardigan's brother. I've kept him since the day John Thatcher's spawn arrived. Uh, he came with them. They kept him in case Cardigan got the upper hand. Zoriel stopped dead in her tracks 
and looked from one man to the other. She gave a commanding glance to the nearby soldiers, and they attacked Taff. He sent one man flying with a well-aimed shoulder tackle, but there were too many of them. They tied his hands and placed the heavy wooden yoke around his neck once again. Taff was calm and composed, his eyes betraying a deep breath. At once, as if by magic, he looked more like a knight than a 21st century soldier. Zorial turned to Rhaegar. You thought Cardigan and his rabble might beat me? And you would then ransom his brother so Cardigan wouldn't kill you? You poor coward, Zorial said, snapping her fingers. Rhaegar's breath was gone, and he sank again to the floor, gasping. The prisoner, whom Rona knew as Taff, was Lachlan, Cardigan's older brother and Dothith's father. He stood there in a precarious position, trying not to let his emotions show, even as overwhelming as they were, chief among them, the joy that Cardigan still lived. It gave him the strength to stand. Zoriel began circling again, her dagger now drawn, playing with the tip in her hand. Ah, but you are the key. When Prince Cardigan and his rebel army finally return to face me after licking their wounds in the wilderness, I will deliver the death blow to the rebellion with you. You've made my conquest so much easier. I shall turn you into a rod to break your brother's back. Regard, I suppose I should thank you for that. She stopped and turned, addressing the Dane who lay on the floor turning purple. You thought to ensure your safety with this prisoner. Well, I suppose he has bought you time. She snapped her fingers, and Rhaegar began taking in deep breaths of air. The fear showed in his eyes as the panicked expression slowly left him. But let's not make your stay too comfortable, shall we? She said to Taff, leaning in from behind and slashing one of his wrists that was chained to the yoke. He was unable to stop the bleeding, and the concern showed in his face. It made Zoriel smile as she rounded to face him. Lachlan's features were defiant, causing Zoriel to look away, ordering one of Rhaegar's men to take Lachlan back to the tower. But keep him alive, she said playfully, as the man half carried Taff, or Lachlan, away. And for pity's sake, feed him something. <laughs> no one else got the joke. She laughed to herself for a minute or two, enjoying the uncomfortable energy in the room. And you, my Capitan, may stay alive. Rhaegar, bowing, only responded with a hateful glance. We're going to take just a minute to hear from our awesome sponsors who make this show possible. Then we'll get back to the show. Looking for quality loose leaf teas and coffee? Look no further than AtticusTea.com. Use our promo code 1232 for 32% off your first order of the finest tea and coffee from AtticusTea.com. 1232 is brought to you by Rumble Stump Entertainment, owned and operated by me, Jet, and my wife, Callie Sue. We love what we do, but each of these episodes requires a ton of work. Although they're awesomely fun to create, each one requires about 300 hours of work from us and our talented team members. So, if you find what we are doing valuable, support us on Patreon.com by subscribing to Rumble Stump. Link in the description below. Thank you for supporting the arts. And now, back to the show. In the tower, the soldier who brought Taff back to the cell bound his wrist to stop the bleeding and left bread and water. Father, my eyes are on you. I am always looking to you. You are the one who pulls my feet out of the net, my comfort, my shelter, the rock I stand on. Taff prayed. He prostrated himself on the ground, with concerns heavy and prayers unrelenting. You've been listening to episode 28 of 1232, produced by Rumble Stump Entertainment, written by Callie Sue and Cheyenne Bell, narrated by Callie Sue. Today's voice talents include Jonathan Cook as Rhaegar, Lauren Harding as Vera, Jessica King as Zoriel, and Matt Burke as Taff. This episode was mixed and engineered by Jet Black. 
with editing and sound design by Casey Caballero, Caballero Sounds. Music by Callie Sue and Jet Black. Static Line, the 1232 theme, is now available wherever you listen to music. Mastered by Zach Bryant, Nine Moon Mastering, with cover art by Niall C. Grant. Continue the adventure in episode 29.